Hi, my name's Phil. I like to talk about politics. So Prime Minister's questions today was at the same time stunningly boring, but actually really interesting, especially for me as well. It was a really odd mix. You had the expected fieriness from the SNPZ in Blackford, though nothing to really concern the Prime Minister who easily deflected his questions. A disappointing nothingness from basically all the other questions. But for once, Jeremy Corbyn actually put Theresa May under a certain amount of pressure. It's still tricky for me to understand how, but I'll try and go through it. He even managed to elicit a fairly tetchy response, which is what it's all about. Getting the Prime Minister to crack is what Prime Minister's Question Time's all about. Um, he's still not pressing her on her non-answers to questions. Instead, you know, he just keeps moving on. Uh, but what he did do was expose the failure of her Brexit strategy. Now, he began by shining a spotlight on the fault lines in the Conservative Party. Good start. Uh, fully approve of that. He quoted the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, as saying that a no-deal Brexit would cost the economy £90 billion. But he also uh, talked about Boris Johnson, who said that it would have no effect. And he asked the Prime Minister who she agreed with. Now, she, of course, had to indicate Hammond um, that, that he was correct in her roundabout way. And that is going to be a recurring theme. Philip Hammond is part of a group of Conservative MPs that are not shy about giving fair warning that they will sink the government of whoever becomes the next Conservative leader if they so much as think about a no deal. He then referred to an apparently leaked cabinet note which described just how poorly we are prepared for no deal. Corbyn asked the Prime Minister to comment on this. Unfortunately, she dodged the question by saying that she wanted MPs to vote for her deal. Now, that is a tried and tested technique because Corbyn has been allowing her to get away with that. That's not what he was asking, of course. He was asking, are we prepared for a no deal, Prime Minister? A perfectly reasonable question as well, because although she has been clear, to be fair, she's been clear that she doesn't want no deal, her own manifesto heavily implied that it would be acceptable to her government. And although I'm pleased with the questions Corbyn was asked today, uh, or asking, I should say, I, am, I do have to say I am still disappointed that he doesn't see the benefit in really hammering the Prime Minister on one point, as opposed to scoring numerous glancing blows that don't really do any damage. Yes, there are lots of things he can pin on. It might be like being a kid in a sweet shop, but he only needs one each week. And to be honest, he can probably only get one if he really tries. Our lack of preparation for no deal is a bloody good one to exploit. Now, I'd have pointed out that she didn't actually answer the question and repeated it. Think Jeremy Paxman taking on Michael Howard. I was entitled to express my views. I was entitled to be consulted. Did you threaten to overrule I, I was not entitled to instruct Derek Lewis, and I did not instruct him. And did the you truth threaten of, to overrule the, him? The truth of the matter is that Mr Marriott was not suspended. Did you I threaten did not, to overrule him? I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice on what I could or could not did do. Did you threaten to I overrule him, Mr scrupulously. Howard? With respect, that is not answering the question of whether you threatened to overrule him. He then asked a series of questions about specific impacts of no deal. So if you are going to ask different questions, that's the obvious place to go, including on our car manufacturing sector, of course, and on food prices and on farming. All things that could put a Conservative government in a difficult position. But as I said, because he didn't land a serious blow with the no deal preparation, May just dodged those questions as well by saying that it was Corbyn's fault that we face a no deal because he didn't vote for her deal. Now, Though I have to say I did like Corbyn's answer to this, the thing is, whenever May or a member of her government over the past few months has come out with the line that it's Labour's fault for not voting for the government's deal, I have been continually saying how disappointed I am that not a single Labour MP that I have heard has stood up and responded by pointing out that actually the reason the deal didn't go through was because Tory MPs voted against it. If they'd have all voted for it, it would have gone through. Simple as that. Well... Corbyn didn't quite do that, but it's disappointing. But he did do the next best thing, which is to point out that actually it's Labour that proposed, proposed a motion to remove no deal as the default Brexit position. May keeps talking about no deal being the default position. Doesn't have to be. Um, and, and that is the reality of the situation. We know that a majority of Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat and SNP MPs, and indeed most MPs outside of those parties, will want us to exit with a deal or not exit at all. They do not want us to go out without a deal under any circumstances. 
but it is the Conservatives who have tried to keep that no deal on the table, where other parties, possible exception of the DUP, have tried to remove it. And it's the Conservatives who think it somehow represents a bargaining chip, despite that having been exposed as a pathetic miscalculation time and time again. And what made me smile a little here is, is not so much what Corbyn was saying, but the response it received. May started to get a little bit personal with her responses by attacking him directly. She called him all mouth and trousers, whereas she usually just gives her non-answer, smiles and sits down, because he never really pins her down to answer him properly. This time, she actually got a bit tetchy. So he, he touched a nerve somehow. You know, maybe it's just the frustration of having to keep going through this charade of Prime Minister's question times when she's effectively not really Prime Minister anymore because she has to step down in a few weeks, but she can't until the new Prime Minister's confirmed. Um, but Corbyn needs to pay attention and make sure he can get under not only her skin uh, for the rest of her premiership, but also her successor as well. I always say Prime Minister's question times, it's not about firing a load of criticism at the government. It's about making them squirm on something. And if you only manage to get them to do that once with your six questions, that'll do. That is a win. So Corbyn is still not doing that, but it's possible that what riled May up was that he stopped reeling off the usual stuff. He reels off statistics that only socialists care about and attacks the Prime Minister with something they care about, that the Conservative Party care about. Her party is pushing for a no-deal Brexit, regardless of who wins the leadership contest. The country is not ready, and she knows that it can never be ready. This is fertile ground for attacking both her legacy and the future of the party that, remember, she has sacrificed her dignity for. So she cares about the party. She doesn't care about anything else, but she cares about the party. So anything he can do to attack either her legacy and hit her ego, or attack the party that she genuinely cares about, that's the way to go. But from Corbyn's point of view, I, I, I felt I had to wonder why he's only now using questions in this way. Why not before? He always let May off the hook before, let her off very lightly. Possibly because she was doing what he wanted. He had to make some opposition to it, but only wanted to make that a token opposition. But with him increasingly edging towards that people's vote, he has perhaps begun to abandon that notion, maybe? Each week for the past month, the official Labour position has been edging more and more to a firm commitment to another referendum. They have already committed technically to another referendum. Um, that is there. That is, that is definite. What we don't know is what sort of referendum they're talking about. What we need to hear now is an unequivocal commitment to having Remain as an option, definitely, uh, but also Labour campaigning for Remaining. Now, that has been implied, and there was another statement he made in the House today. It's been implied just not stated yet. He's edging ever closer to it. Um, so possibly sees no benefit in letting the Conservatives get away with Brexit without robust attacks in the Commons anymore, which is all to the good. As for Theresa May, she's got another two of these Prime Minister's question times, as far as I can tell. I'm assuming that Parliament will confirm the new Prime Minister by July the 24th, so that the various party leaders can take their first pot shots at whoever wins that at that date. Now, if I were JC, I'd be preparing to ask only questions that expose the divisions within the Conservative Party by getting Theresa May over the next couple of weeks to make statements that are going to be in stark contrast to the position of the leadership candidates. So when the new Prime Minister is confirmed, he'll be able to expose the very different views in that Conservative Party. Perhaps he could even quote Hunt and Johnson with their own attacks against Theresa May's time in office. When Corbyn became leader, he said he wanted a kinder form of politics. Well, kindness to the Conservatives is not endearing me to him. So bugger that and get the metaphorical boot in Jeremy, is what I would say. So anyway, it might be some interesting Prime Minister's Question Times coming up following, uh, following this. Let's see. Let's see if he keeps the ball rolling. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button, subscribe for further content. Until next time, I'll see you later.